I am Gregory C. Corot Boyd, Master Credentialed Religious Educator and Aspirant for Unitarian Universalist Ministry, as well as a member of this congregation. And I welcome you to this virtual worship service of the Unitarian Church of Harrisburg. Because we cannot meet in the church building, there have been many program changes, but there are also new programs to strengthen and serve members and friends of the church during this time of physical distancing. Every Sunday when we are not in the building, there is a live virtual coffee hour following the service from 11.30 a.m. until 1 p.m. Please read news you can use and other emails you receive from the church, and please check the website regularly for updates. Please note the times when the minister is available via Zoom for you to check in and talk. And please send your joy or sorrow via the link in the email you received and indicate whether you give permission for it to be read in the next week's service. Whoever you are, wherever you live, whomever you love, whatever you do for a living, you are welcome at the Unitarian Church of Harrisburg. Come, let us worship together. I invite those of you at home to light a chalice, a candle, or whatever you choose to serve as your chalice at home. If you need more time to retrieve your object, please pause the video. Our chalice lighting this morning comes from the Reverend Dr. Mark Morrison Reed, who reminds us, the central task of the religious community is to unveil the bonds that bind each to all. There is a connectedness, a relationship discovered amid the particulars of our own lives and the lives of others. Once felt, it inspires us to act for justice. It is the church that assures us that we are not struggling for justice on our own, but as members of a larger community. The religious community is essential for alone, our vision is too narrow to see all that must be seen, and our strength too limited to do all that must be done. Together, our vision widens and our strength is renewed. Love is the spirit of this congregation, and service is our gift. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to speak our truths in love, and to help one another. Please join me in singing our opening hymn, Meditation on Breathing. Oh, <laughs> 
Good morning, everyone. For those that don't know me, I am Amy Firestein, the UCH RE Committee Chair and Acting RE Coordinator. I don't know about you, but this week was a very stressful one for me. And in discussions with others, they indicated that they too were feeling the pressures of this continued isolation. During the first few weeks of the stay at home requirement, I saw a lot of online posts and poems and blurbs about how it was almost like a forced way for us to help clean the earth. I have to admit, I think in some ways this is the universe's way of forcing us to look at how we used to do things and how we're doing things now, and maybe give us a chance to find new ways to do things in the future. It's almost like a forced do-over. Recently, I participated in a Zoom call with three of my friends. We make a point to get together for a weekend during the summer every year. And during one of our many daily texting chats, we decided we'd set up a Zoom meeting and meet in person. During that call, we all mentioned how much fun it had been to see each other and talk. And we all asked the question, how come we never thought to do this before? We all live fairly far apart from each other. We realized that in the past, our day-to-day -day lives have been so busy that we just never took the time to schedule something like a Zoom meeting before. So in a way, the stay-at-home mandate gave us a chance to do just that. So in the spirit of getting to do something better than was done before, I'm going to tell you a story about a young boy named Jonathan and his chance to do things over and get them right. Jonathan was an only child. And while he had friends who complained and wished for a brother or sister, Jonathan loved being the only kid in his family. Being an only child meant that he didn't have to share anything with siblings. And he had his mom and dad all to himself, at least when they were all home together. After schoolwork was done and mom and dad had finished work for the day, they would have dinner together. And on Friday nights, it was family game night. Shortly after Jonathan's 10th birthday, Jonathan's world was turned completely upside down. For starters, his parents announced that in six months, he would be getting a baby brother or sister. And then to make matters worse, his parents were going on vacation, just the two of them, for two weeks, and that Jonathan would be staying with his grandmother. Now, Jonathan loved his grandmother, but he didn't understand why he couldn't go with his parents, nor did he like the idea of having to stay at his grandmother's house for two weeks he would much prefer for her to stay at his house with him. He didn't like the idea of having to leave all his stuff behind. Two weeks seemed like a very long time to be away from all his toys and games. But he was told that because his grandmother had taken in a family from her church who needed a place to stay until they could get back on their feet, and since she had agreed to watch their son while the parents went out job hunting during the day, he had to go and stay at her house. On the Friday that his parents took him to stay with his grandmother, almost a full week after he was told about his parents' trip, Jonathan was in a very bad mood. Since the moment his parents had told him about the baby and their trip, he had grown increasingly grumpy with each passing day. He had turned down his parents' attempts to play games and do things together. He had refused because he didn't want to interrupt their family routine. Fridays were game nights, and he didn't want to play a game on a Monday or a Tuesday. It wasn't how they did things. Upon arriving at his grandmother's house, he was polite enough to give her a hug hello, but then went straight to the room he would be staying in. He barely returned the hugs that his parents gave him before they left to head to the airport. That night, he came out of the room for dinner, but then went right back to the bedroom, turning down his grandmother's request to play some games, instead sulking alone until he'd fallen asleep. Grandma's guests had been out the night before, and so Jonathan had not had a chance to meet them. So it wasn't until the next morning at breakfast that Jonathan was introduced to Mr. and Mrs. Gray and their eight-year-old son, Mario. If Jonathan had been in better spirits, he might have been more excited about a boy closer to his age staying in his grandmother's house. But his mood had not improved since the night before. And instead of being friendly, he barely said more than hello to the Gray family. In fact, when Jonathan went to get some cereal, there was just enough to fill his bowl with a little bit left over. So he finished the entire box not bothering to offer any to Mario. He watched instead as Mario's mom made Mario two slices of toast with butter. After breakfast, when his grandmother asked if he'd like to play a game, Jonathan decided it was time to stop being alone in his room, so he agreed. However, he refused to allow his grandmother to invite Mario to play with them. 
the Greys went out to run some errands, taking Maria with them. So that left Jonathan alone with his grandmother, which was fine with him. He didn't want to get to know Mario. He didn't want to share his grandmother or his parents with anyone. It was one of the many things Jonathan thought about ever since his grandma, his parents had told him he was getting a brother or sister. At dinner time, the Greys had returned and they all sat down to eat the meal Jonathan's grandmother had prepared. The Greys tried to get to know Jonathan asking him questions, but he really didn't want to get to know the Greys. So he only gave short responses. After dinner, Mrs. Gray and Mario helped his grandmother clean up, and Jonathan went back to his room to be alone. Later that night, after his parents had called to say hi, and Jonathan barely said much at all, Jonathan's grandmother came to say goodnight. We need to have a little talk, young man, she said in a gentle but stern voice as she sat down on his bed. What if I don't want to talk? Jonathan replied. That's okay. You don't have to, but you are going to listen, his grandmother replied. Now I know that it seems like the world is against you and that everything is unfair right now, but this sulky and grumpy attitude has got to stop. You need to realize that your parents love you very much, but they are allowed to have some alone time. Parents need time to reconnect with each other in order to keep their relationship strong. And they aren't going to get much more alone time after the baby is born. I don't want a brother or sister, Jonathan mumbled into his pillow and then turned to look at his grandmother. I don't want things to change. Why do they have to? Because things have to change. Life would be very boring if everything stayed the same. His grandmother gently patted his leg. You will change your mind about the baby, you'll see. You have had 10 wonderful years of having your parents to yourself. And you will realize that having someone to play with and look after will be much more enjoyable than being an only child. But despite how you feel about everything now, there is no excuse for the way you have been behaving, especially towards people you have never met before. I love you, but I am very disappointed in you. I want you to think about how you can make things right. She leaned down and kissed Jonathan on the forehead. Get some sleep. And I expect the grandson that I have known and loved for 10 years to emerge in the morning. No more grumpy. Got it? Or I'll send you to work in the mines with the other six dwarfs. Jonathan chuckled a little and nodded. Good night, Grandma. So when the door was closed behind his grandmother, he stared into the darkness and thought about what she had said. She was right. He had been acting like Grumpy from the Seven Dwarfs. And the more he thought about it, the more ashamed he was of how he had behaved, especially towards the Greys. If only he could get a do-over, he would do things much differently. But things like that didn't happen. So he made himself a promise to be much more nicer to the Greys the next day and to apologize to his parents when they called that next night. The next morning, Jonathan woke up and headed downstairs to breakfast. The scene was similar to what it had been the previous morning. The Greys were just coming into the kitchen, the box of cereal was on the counter, and his grandmother had just put out bread for toast. Morning, Jonathan. I'd like to introduce you to Mr. and Mrs. Gray and their son, Mario, Jonathan's grandmother said as she greeted everyone. At first, Jonathan thought his grandmother was just joking, giving him a chance to start fresh with the Greys, till Mrs. Gray responded, It's very nice to meet you, Jonathan. Jonathan then looked at the clock on the windowsill that not only told the time, but the date and weather. He had to look at the date twice before he realized that somehow his wish had been granted and he was being given the chance to do the entire day over again. It's nice to meet you too, Jonathan responded. He then went to the counter, got a bowl for cereal, and then remembering how greedy he had been during the first version of the day, grabbed a second bowl. He then picked up the box of cereal. It was indeed, as he remembered, almost empty. He turned to Mario. Would you like some? Mario nodded and Jonathan measured equal amounts of the remaining cereal into the two bowls. And then after pouring milk in his, he did the same to the other and the two sat down at the table to eat. After breakfast, when his grandmother asked if he'd like to play Parcheesi, Jonathan eagerly agreed and then turned to Mario and asked if Mario wanted to play too. Later after dinner was over, Jonathan stayed in the kitchen to help clean up along with Mrs. Gray and Mario. When his parents called to talk, Jonathan made sure to apologize for his behavior over the last couple of days and then told them all about meeting the Grays and hanging out with Mario. That night, when his grandmother came to say goodnight, she kissed him and said, I'm glad to see you were in a much better mood today. 
than you were when you arrived yesterday. The day is brighter when we are pleasant, isn't it? She then winked and closed the door. Jonathan looked at the closed door and wondered if his grandmother had a day over day too. Well, in a way, everyone had been given the chance to do the day over, but he was pretty sure he was the only one who remembered the first version of the day. But no matter what, he was glad he had gotten a chance to do things over. His grandmother had been right. It was a much nicer day than his first go around had been. So in the end, Jonathan realized that by being given the gift of a do-over, he had the chance to make amends and do things better the second time around. While we can't really go back and do a day over again, after all, time travel has not been invented yet, we can take a look at how we have done things in the past and find better and new ways to do them moving forward. Focus on what we can change rather than what we can't. And now I leave you with this question. If you had the chance to do a day over again, what day would it be and how would you do things differently? We are the ones, we are the ones we've been waiting. We are the ones, we are the ones we've been waiting. We are the ones, we are the ones we've been waiting. We are the ones, we are the ones we've been waiting. combat a virus is with an antivirus, then what is the way to combat an apocalypse? Maybe we've done all we can and we are trying so hard to learn and do the right things to get through this. We need an antipocalypse. We need not to endure, but a way out and escape. There are many places to escape. But the quintessential escape is to an island, one where the sun is always shining. The best thing we did in Martinique was a catamaran trip. 
We sailed down the Caribbean coast and stopped at a few bays, saw some interesting sights, were supplied with food and drink. The entire itinerary was determined by the captain, all the work done by the crew. No planning, no responsibility, just relax and enjoy. The boat consisted mostly of French people with only a handful of English speakers. I introduced myself to everybody. I have no fear to use my French, bad as it is. There was a group of French people at a table and I sat down with them. I then went to a very normal party conversation topic we frequently use in the United States with someone we have just met. I asked the person across from me what they did for a living. I chose this topic because I know the French words for several occupations, so it would be easier for me to understand the responses. I posed this question to everyone, and everyone responded in turn, somewhat uneasily, while everyone else kept silent as they spoke. When they finished, one of the women at the table glared at me. She said, take your turn, you made us do it. I sensed more irritation in her prompt than curiosity. I was happy to answer. Only months later did I learn that in French culture, asking a person their profession is just a bit too close to asking how much money they make, since you might be able to assume their income level based on their job. Well, I'd never be so crass as to ask a person at a party, so how much money do you make? Oh well, that ship had sailed. My proficiency in the French language and culture were both lacking, but many of the French forgave my shortcomings. One of the French men clued me that one of the camembert cheeses was of higher quality than the other. I took a small taste of both, and I could tell he was steering me in the right direction. We stopped at a bay to do some snorkeling, and I had just got in the water, and my new French baker friend was yelling, La Tortue! La Tortue! He wanted me to put my camera under the water immediately. I did as he suggested, just in time to catch the turtle coming right at me as she surfaced to get a breath. On the boat, I had met and spoke with a really nice couple from Paris. Jean-Claude and Chantal. Between snorkeling stops, I often went out onto the cargo net to enjoy the breeze and the sun, and one of those times, Jean-Claude followed me to continue talking. I tried to carry on a conversation with Jean-Claude in French, but it was difficult without his wife. I'd ask him a question he wouldn't understand. I'd try again louder, slower. Sometimes his wife, who had stayed back on the boat under the shaded canopy, would yell at him, a bit annoyed. She would then repeat the exact question I had just asked him. Then he would understand when she asked. It was funny, but also interesting to me. Here was a man right next to me who couldn't understand me when I spoke his language, albeit poorly. Yet another person far away who had to compete with more distracting sounds could understand me. Obviously, as a speaker of a foreign language, there are many things that I'm doing that are wrong. But in this example, the difference lies in the receiver of the word, not the speaker. As a listener, how trained is your mind to be open? Can you receive a message with strange sound quality, strange word choice, strange word order, and be open to the possible meanings? Can you hold a foreign presentation in your mind while you process the possible meanings of those ideas until you can relate it to something more familiar to you, more understandable to you? Can you slow down your process of drawing conclusions and keep processing the bizarre data you have? Can you be okay with progressing with your understanding, although your understanding is not certain? Can you keep trying to find the most likely meanings, the most likely truths? How do we live with coronavirus 
It's new to all of us. Do your best to learn and act prudently, but don't obsess on it. Refocus, get absorbed in something else, escape. The concept of social distancing is so foreign to us as humans and most of our various cultures. Doubtless what we think we know today may be replaced with better facts in the future. We may overdo it. We may underdo it. We may do it just fine, but someone else might be uncomfortable and may want more. You may want more or less. Do your best to acquire and process information about this apocalypse. But when you've done that, stop. Allow yourself some moments to listen to a song, get lost in a novel, or just close your eyes. Relax. Imagine the end of a full day frolicking under the hot Caribbean sun as you lie on a cargo net suspended over the sea, the gentle sprays of water cooling you, almost drifting off to sleep. Hopefully my lessons from this day in Martinique have left an impression on you the way they did on me. Today, in this congregation, someone is hurting or in sorrow. Today, in this congregation, someone is anxious because of events in the world. Today, in this congregation, someone is lonely. And today, in our congregation, someone is filled with joy and wants to celebrate. For all the fear and sorrow in the world, there are still moments of joy. We received no joys or sorrows by email today. We hold all of those joys and sorrows that go unspoken in our hearts. They remind us that when there is birth, life goes on. When there is death, life goes on. When there is joy, life goes on. And when there is sorrow, life goes on. May we always live in trust and love that all joy might be shared and all sorrow comforted. This is our prayer. Amen and blessed be.
I was 16 when I first read Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness and then saw the film by Francis Ford Coppola, Apocalypse Now, based on that novel. Both the novel and the film deal with the idea of conquest by an outside power. In Conrad's novel, it is the conquest of the interior of the African continent by European forces. Coppola transposes that dynamic a few decades into the future, dealing with the end of the Vietnam War. Both the novel and the movie deal with the slow descent into madness of the crew of the ship in Conrad's case and the army battalion in Coppola's movie, as they cannot unsee the horror that they're doing to the land that they're in, as they cannot unsee the horror that they're inflicting on the people who live there. That brings us to the concept of apocalypse. Apocalypse is a Greek term about unveiling, a revelation. That is why the final book in Christian Bible is called Revelation. It is dealing with an unveiling, a removing of obstacles to seeing what is there. Interestingly enough, in Christian and Hebrew contexts, apocalypse is always about things that you cannot see except for this time of unveiling. There are several other concepts of apocalypse, certainly in the Mayan tradition and the Hindu tradition, as well as other indigenous populations to the lands that we now occupy. And again, they all deal with a necessariness of destruction, a necessariness of suffering, a necessariness of what we have going on now in order to see things that were totally impossible for us to see before now. Which is to say, we're not living in the apocalypse right now. While we are certainly experiencing an unveiling, there are truths that we can no longer unknow and no longer ignore. The necessariness of the suffering to get us to this point is not true. We know that this suffering is not needed. We have had plagues and epidemics that have swept our lands before, and what is true of them has always been true. In the HIV AIDS epidemic of the early 1980s that continues to ravage nations around the world, but is largely controlled here in the United States, we know that investing money in finding treatments was necessary. When we had polio epidemics, we knew that investing money in vaccines was necessary. We quarantined children and families countless summers to prevent polio outbreaks, to curb polio outbreaks. And we certainly know in 1918, a time when churches also closed their doors to control the outbreak of influenza, a, a strain which was erroneously called the Spanish flu because Spain was the only nation that correctly reported its death toll, a time when it was illegal to go out in public without a mask. We know how to treat pandemics. We know how to deal with pestilence that sweeps our land. So in order to learn these truths about the health disparities of black people and poor people and Latinx people, we know that we did not need this suffering in order to confront what has already been there. Now these truths that we cannot ignore, these truths such as people need health care, it is important to have money to buy food, that the stock market is unpredictable because there are no laws of the market. There are only complex formulae that predict human behavior. And if we could predict human behavior reliably, we would be doing more of that and less of figuring out how to get ourselves through political inaction or sometimes blatant and intentional ignorance. We know at this time that the truths that we can no longer ignore 
can be overwhelming. They can be absolutely overwhelming. They can prevent us from taking the actions that we do need to take. But we're already taking some of them as a congregation. We're already taking some of these actions as a nation. I give great thanks to those of you who are doing the grocery shopping for other members in this congregation, for those of you who have made and delivered masks, for those of you who are respecting times at grocery stores that privilege elderly and other high-risk populations so that they can do their shopping before other people do their shopping. I thank you all. And there's so much more we can do we must listen to the most vulnerable populations, some of which we may not have included in our broadest reaching thinking so far. We have to make sure that we protect the sex workers and others who work in cash-based jobs, those who have not filed taxes for a long time or had no need to file tax return claims. They will not receive stimulus checks either by mail or by direct deposit. We need to make sure that we listen to the homeless and make sure that we can supply them with soap and running water and facilities to clean and bathe themselves. We know that no one is disposable in this time. Everyone is necessary and we need to make sure we're doing what these vulnerable populations ask for. We need to protect the U.S. Postal Service, an industry that is the only one that still delivers to every address in the United States. What happens to vulnerable populations who do not have access to the traditional banking system when there is no mail to deliver them the stimulus check they so desperately need? when that stimulus check won't get here until December at the earliest. There is so much more we can do, and we know that we can do it together. We must make sure that we are working together, and we must make sure that we make it through this time together. Dear ones, it is not the apocalypse. It is not the apocalypse. None of this suffering is necessary for us to learn what we have already known. When we value wealth above life, health and safety outcomes for the poorest, for the most disenfranchised, for those pushed the most to the sides, is deeply compromised. We're getting the system we're getting the outcomes of the system we set up. It is not the apocalypse. And while we know things that we can never unknow, we know that this is not the end of the world. We know that we can make it through together and we know we can only make it through together. In these times, we need one another. Be good to one another. Ask for what you need and ask others how you can help. Since it's not the apocalypse now, we must go forward. Amen and blessed be. As you are separated and sitting in your homes today, the Unitarian Church of Harrisburg is still freely gathering. Each of you is the church. And the church is created, sustained, and supported by you. 
the ministry continues even when the building is closed. On your screen, you will find directions on how to give an offering today in support of the Unitarian Church of Harrisburg and our community partner for the month of May. Each month, we share half of our Sunday plate with a local nonprofit organization. Our partner in May is the Central Pennsylvania Food Bank. The Central Pennsylvania Food Bank serves 27 counties across Pennsylvania. An affiliate of an affiliate of Feeding America and Feeding Pennsylvania, the Food Bank maintains healthy food hub locations in Harrisburg and Williamsport in order to serve the geographically dispersed community and distributes food via a large network of local partner agencies. Your financial support and commitment matter. We appreciate your generosity. Invite us into a time of reflection, prayer, and meditation. For those of you who have made it to this point in the service without moving around too much, it might be time for a bit of a stretch break. If you're with someone waiting to hear yes first, perhaps ask for a hug, a hand squeeze, a shoulder touch, any small gesture of affection. Again, waiting to hear yes before you proceed. Remember, we are people who live in bodies. Bodies are meant to feel joy and to know when it's time to take a break. If you need more time, please pause the video. What follows is an encanted or sung litany. It may be familiar to those of you with Catholic or Episcopalian roots. This litany a great litany for these times, comes to us most directly from King's Chapel, a Unitarian Universalist congregation in Boston that changed the Book of Common Prayer in the 17th century and continues in the liberal tradition today. After the prayer, we engage in a time of silence. Spirit of life, be with us now. Ancestors who set the path that we now follow, be with us now. Spirit of love who directs our hearts toward justice and service, be with us now. We pray to do better together on our best days than the pain we cause alone on our worst days. Help us to forgive others when it is time, and to be gentle with one another, for in one another's mercy do we put our trust. Help us be a people From all evil and mischief, from isolation, from greed, and from everlasting destruction. Help us continue. From all indifference, 
from boasting vainglory and hypocrisy, from envy, hatred, and malice, and all uncharitableness, from valuing property over people, and from lies that serve only self-interest. Help us continue. From lightning and tempest, from plague, pestilence, and famine, from battle and murder, and from death unprepared for. Help us continue. From all sedition, privy conspiracy and rebellion, from hardness of heart and contempt for covenantal community. Help us continue. In all time of our tribulation, in all time of our prosperity, in the hour of death and in the days after life ends. Help us continue. We pray for all ministers, lay and ordain, that both by their preaching and living, they help build and welcome all into community. Hear our prayer. We pray that the President of the United States, the Governor of this Commonwealth, the Mayor of this city, the judges and the magistrates, and all others in authority, exercise wisdom and understanding, giving them grace to execute justice and to maintain truth. Hear our prayer. We pray for all colleges and seminaries of learning, all instructors of youth, and all means of meaningful knowledge, virtue, and spirituality. Hear our prayer. We pray for all sex workers, grocery store workers, and food service employees, delivery drivers, and postal service workers, for those without homes or adequate supplies, to physically distance. We pray for those whose homes are places of abuse. Bring to all these our compassion and faith. Hear our prayer. We pray for all people to give all nations unity, peace, and concord, and to give us a heart to love and respect, and diligently live in beloved community. Hear our prayer. We pray for all people increase of grace to know and respond to the deepest callings of community and that it bring forth a willingness to quest together. Hear our prayer. We pray to bring into the way of truth all such as have erred and are deceived, to strengthen such as do defend, to comfort and help the weak-hearted, to raise up those who fall, and finally to give us victory over all greed. Hear our prayer. We pray to succor, help, and comfort all who are in danger, necessity, and tribulation, to preserve all who travel by land, by sea, or by air, all young children, all sick persons. We pray for mercy upon all prisoners and captives, to defend and provide for the orphaned and widowed, and all who are desolate and oppressed. Hear our prayer. We pray to strengthen those who heal the sick, lighten the sorrowful, and comfort the dying. Hear our prayer. We pray to have compassion with all people. Hear our prayer. We pray for the forgiveness of our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers, and to turn their hearts. Hear our prayer. We pray to preserve for our use the kindly fruits of the earth, so that in due time we may enjoy them. Hear our prayer. We pray for true contrition, for forgiveness of all of our harms, negligences, and ignorances, and to endue us with a spirit of justice, to amend our lives to beloved community, so that we seek sacred connection. Hear our prayer. Give us peace in our time. Be merciful with us. Reveal the consequences of harm we do. Reward us not for our iniquities. 
Spirit of life, who hears all our prayers, help us to commit to deeper service. So all who work for beloved community, bring hope of saving one another, for a world transformed by the presence of justice. Amen. Blessed be. Please join in singing our closing hymn, For the Earth Forever Turning. Beloved, we have come to the end of our service and we are joyful because we know that we are the ones we've been waiting for to provide sanctuary to the world. We know there is so much injustice that we can no longer unsee and we will work together accountably to make the world better together forever. Go forth blessed. Thank you.